I have always been interested in communication. I wanted to support a positive social change. What can we do if we're invested in real safety, regardless of all of our various identities? The way policing and incarceration are set up, it creates more harm. It creates a higher likelihood of violence. And there are solutions, but for a lot of different reasons, we're just not aware of those yet. If you look at what law enforcement does versus what the actual results are, there's not safety being provided. My goal was really to have an opening for discussions for people that aren't abolitionists, but don't know what the solutions are. The more that people are taken care of, the more that people are treated with dignity and respect, the safer we all are. When people feel heard, valued, and understood, our guard comes down and we tend to be more open to partnerships and solutions. It's about creating a culture of care. It's really about reimagining how we view safety. Are we committed to taking care of each other or are we not? Welcome to Angel City Culture Quest, where art, social justice, and the environment meet in Los Angeles. I am your host, Melina Paris, and I welcome you to this episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Angel City Culture Quest. Today, we are talking with Matthew Solomon, director of the film Reimagining Safety. The film, as well as Matthew's other work as a conflict resolution facilitator, is based entirely in humanity and care. Hi, Matthew. How are you today? I'm great. I'm great. I'm really happy to be here with you. I'm happy you're here, too. Thank you. Here's a little bit of information about our guest. Director, filmmaker, author, conflict resolution facilitator, Matthew, was born and raised in Los Angeles and has been in the entertainment business for most of his adult life, first in music and then as an award-winning writer-director. His passion for people, equity, and social justice led him to work as a consultant for organizations needing help with conflict resolution and partnership building. During the pandemic, he returned to school to obtain a master's degree in public administration so that he could have more of an impact in helping create communities that work for everyone. His course of study involved a deep dive into understanding policing, the carceral system, and public safety. Now, his work involves utilizing art to influence positive change. A brief synopsis of Reimagining Safety. Worldwide protests following the 2020 murder of George Floyd included calls to defund or abolish the police until a sharp rise in crime gave politicians and police supporters the fuel they needed to suppress the movement. Unfortunately, a detailed conversation about transforming public safety was never had. In Reimagining Safety, shot on iPhone, 10 experts, including L.A. County District Attorney George Gascon, USC law professor Dr. Jody Armour, and law enforcement expert Alex S. Vital, discuss the false premise that more police and more prisons make us safer. It does this while providing practical and actionable solutions toward achieving systems of safety that work for everyone. The film is already receiving very positive feedback and support from social justice organizations and newly elected progressive leaders. Reimagining Safety just screened to 180 attendees at Rhodes College in Memphis, hosted by a coalition of social justice organizations. It received a special mention award at its official West Coast premiere at the San Pedro International Film Festival and was best documentary feature at the Crown Point International Film Festival in Chicago. Congratulations, Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. That's Thank great you. to hear. Yeah. So the film had its genesis when you went back to school during the pandemic. Yeah. You were in the Master's in Public Administration program at Claremont Lincoln University, and the film was your thesis project. Can you talk about your thought process leading up to this project? Yeah, it was not anything I had originally set out to do or intended to do. As you mentioned, I had been a filmmaker, you know, writer and director, and that was all scripted content. I started doing conflict resolution work. I have always been interested in people and relationships and communication and was always taking seminars and workshops and trainings to be better myself. 
And then along the way, I got trained to do this kind of work. And then with a background in anti-racism as a student, but just a knowledge of people's lived experiences and how we interact with each other and things rooted in sociology and anthropology, but also ontology, like the study of what it means to be human. And so with all of that, when the pandemic started and we couldn't go anywhere and I couldn't travel and all of that, short story is I decided to go back to school and finish a bachelor's degree that I started 30 years ago and then continued on to get a master's degree because I'm white, cis hetero white male from Los Angeles. So I wanted to use my privilege and my access to help support a positive social change. And so I found this public administration program at Claremont Lincoln University which dealt with social justice without saying it, but it was social justice, it's transformational leadership, it's sustainability, it's how communities are created and maintained and how people are kept safe. And so I was applying the coursework to the current issues, which were policing and incarceration post George Floyd. And so it was just the process of continuing to see that the way policing and incarceration are set up, it creates more harm, it creates more unrest, it creates a higher likelihood of violence. But I was also interested in, well, if we don't do this, then what do we do? And so that was my area of study. And when it came time to do my thesis project, I really wanted to look at what are the alternatives? What can we do if we care about one another, if we're invested in real safety for all of us, regardless of color, gender, all of our various different identities? So if we were going to do that, what would that look like? And so one of my academic advisors knew I had made films and was like, you're creative. Why don't you do a documentary instead of writing a paper? And so you know, I was like, well, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, so it's going to be like a movie no. if I do it like a movie. <laughs> and she's like, okay, cool. And, she, you know, she was like, it could be like, you know, 10 minutes or so. And I, I said, I can't do this in 10 minutes. It's going to be like a big thing. Yeah. And, and so luckily she was like, well, go ahead and do that anyway. And I did. And I just followed the path of finding the people to interview, filming the interviews, having the list of questions, but being willing to, as a researcher slash journalist slash documentarian, just go down like whatever path. Path. I'm led down so mm -hmm. they could tell their stories. It was amazing. 10 people from very different perspectives collectively sharing that, yeah, there's a lot of problems with policing and incarceration, and there are solutions that are common sense, but for a lot of different reasons, we're just not aware of those yet. So. Yeah, we're trying to get there. Yes. That sounds like an awesome program, by the way, too. It, it was, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a masterpiece film that everyone needs to see. It discusses issues of policing through an informative lens, but it also explains in practical terms, like you were alluding to, the ways that policing issues more harm than help, especially in black and brown communities. This is found, for instance, in tactics like escalation, which former LAPD detective Hadia Kennedy, who is in the film, she explains this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. You had a recent screening last week in San mm -hmm. Jose. Can you talk about the screening? And I think you also expected a former member of the police union to be in attendance and the response to the film. Yeah, we screened in San Jose. There was a coalition of I think five different organizations that co-hosted from the Bay Area. There were 90 people who attended the screening wow. and the panel. And it was really great. Like people were really interested and invested. And the panel discussion, there were uh, one, two, three, four, five of us, <laughs> counting myself <laughs> on the panel. Nikki Black, who's in the film, she's a sociologist from Inglewood and an award-winning slam poet. She's awesome. She came up for that. And then there was a gentleman, Sean Allen, who had actually run for sheriff of that county. And it was really interesting because he watched the film and he was like, I agree with everything in the film. And was really blown away that Hadia Kennedy, who's former LAPD officer who's in the film, he was like, I can't believe you got a cop to say all that stuff. You know, wow. he's like, we don't talk about that, that these are things that we just don't get into or we're not allowed to. And so I didn't know how he was going to respond. It's always interesting with law enforcement, because if you look at the history of law enforcement, if you look at what law enforcement does versus what the actual results are, and if we can take a step back and 
kind of disconnect from the emotional attachment to like, we need police to keep us safe and like really look at the results in terms of real safety, especially for black and brown communities and underserved and lower income communities. There's not safety being provided. You know, it's more command and control and rounding people up and discarding them. So to have a former police officer who ran for the office of sheriff to say, yeah, I agree with a lot of what's in the film was pretty impactful. George Gascon, who's in the film, he was a police officer for 40 years. And even Hadia, it makes sense. The former police officers, they have a different perspective from not only their training and their immersion in the police culture, but from being on the streets and interacting with people and seeing people at their worst. It makes sense that some of the places where there are ideas that are not aligned, where there's disagreement on what we can do to replace or what the alternatives are, that comes up with law enforcement, which is understandable because they have their perspective. That said, I mean, everybody agrees across the board that the more that communities are resourced and the more that people are taken care of, the more that people are treated with dignity and respect, the safer we all are. So then it's just a matter of how much policing do we need. Exactly. That's really good news. It's almost like kind of breaking through a wall. You're like getting that first brick out yeah. and <laughs> pushing through. <laughs> it's sure. a process. I wanted to note, you said Tim McCosker, the Council District 15 council member, which includes San Pedro, has been involved with the police unions for a long time. In fact, he's a former LAPD union lobbyist. And after he saw the screening in San Pedro, he said, this is a really great film, and it encompasses the last 40 years of my life. You said his feedback was great, and that you also understand the desire to have a well-balanced presentation that tells all sides. With that, you present this film in four parts. Part one is police, prisons, and incarceration. Part two, why is it like this? Part three, the role of the media. And part four, what now? Solutions and alternatives. I wanted to go back to balance. Can you explain your thoughts on that that you referred to in terms of this film? Yeah. And actually, I wanted to mention Tim McOsker. This was after the screening. I don't know if it was related or not, but he and Hugo Soto Martinez, who's another council member up around Hollywood, they co-sponsored the bill with items that LAPD should not respond to. So mm -hmm. they worked together on that to reduce the LAPD contact with certain things like mental health calls. So I thought that was really great. As far as balance, this started as an academic project, and it would be real easy to do something like this and just interview a bunch of activists and call it a day. But my work, going back to conflict resolution even, is to really be able to get a clear perspective on the different points of view and to find the common ground, but to really understand where people are coming from and why we think the way we do about certain things. Because when people feel heard, valued, and understood, our guard tends to come down and we tend to be more open to partnerships and solutions and different things like that. So the activist part is really important, but also the law enforcement perspective, the prosecutor perspective. That was something that came up in my coursework that I hadn't even considered is the role of prosecutors in what they charge, what gets sentenced, how it gets sentenced. And so there's a big influence that prosecutors can have on the trajectory of somebody's life, especially if they're arrested for something when they're 18 years old. So I wanted the legal side, I wanted the mental health side for sure, because that's something that comes up a lot, mental health, social work. Gina Viola, who's in the film, ran for the mayor of the city of Los Angeles on an abolitionist platform and came in third. And so that was something that was really intriguing to me because she ran on this platform and had a lot of support. And her list of endorsements is all the top social justice organizations in and around wow. Los Angeles. So I wanted to get her perspective. Senate Devermont is known as Mr. Checkpoint. He's a police auditor. So he regularly films police interactions and interacts with police. So I wanted his perspective. So what started out as I figured four or five people maybe grew to 10 people that I ended up interviewing. Yeah. It was very well-rounded. It all came together beautifully. Now, the original title was going to be, what if we abolish the police? <laughs> yeah, the working title. <laughs> what was the process and the reasoning behind coming to reimagining safety? Yeah, as an artist, as a filmmaker, 
recognizing the importance of titles and in music and writing and film, I've always been really great with titles. And it's always something that for the most part, I would start with the title or I'd have an idea and then the title would come up and then I would write whatever it is. This project was the complete opposite. It was an academic project. So originally I was talking about reimagining public safety Mm -hmm. and that seemed good for a college paper, a grad paper, but not really interesting, you know, in terms of a movie, you know, reimagining public safety. It sounds like a instructional something, right? Uh So that seems sterile. My path through the coursework and discovery with this was really about like, what is abolition and what does that mean? And it's not just getting rid of police and prisons. It's really about creating a culture of care. It's really about love for one another and making sure we're all taken care of and investing in each other and breaking down the barriers that keep us separate. So as an inquiry, it seemed like, what if we abolish the police? What would that look like? So that became the working title. My goal with the film after class was really to have a bridge and an opening for discussions for people that aren't abolitionists who maybe recognize that there are problems but don't really know what the solutions are. I wanted it to be more accessible and interesting so that people would watch it and then it could open up a discussion. And so I figured having abolition in the title would cut off a big group of people from the get-go. You know, I also, having George Gascon in the film, and he's not an abolitionist, so Mm -hmm. I didn't want to represent him in that way because I think he and progressive prosecutors like him who are working towards change are doing a lot of great things. And the rhetoric around defunding the police and things like that are so weaponized by people on the right specifically, but even people on the left have a problem with that terminology. So Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have a film associated with him that would hurt anything that he's trying to... he has a hard enough job like he gets it from all sides anyway so you know it was a lot of considerations and when it came down to it i spent a lot of time talking to the people in the film and writing five pages of lists of titles and it just kept coming back to reimagining safety and basically the san pedro film festival was on february 3rd and i needed a title Oh, uh, for that. And I was like, "How? when do you need the title? And and the organizer, her name's Ziggy. She's Ziggy. awesome. Yeah. yeah. She was like, I need it like a month before. So, all right, well, <laughs> down to the it. wire. This is it. <laughs> Imagining safety. And, it works. Yeah, it works. And and a lot of people have actually said that they, they really like that title. And yeah, um, even people who had seen the previous title were like, no, this is much better. It's more accessible. And the film isn't all about abolition either. So it's really about reimagining how we view safety and what keeps us safe and who keeps us safe and what that would look like. So I think it's hopefully it's better. (laughs) Yeah. And I would say that you were successful in creating that bridge because of all the different perspectives and the voices Mm -hmm. that are in the film. And Speaking of George Gascon, he was a great and logical choice to include in your film. And I commend you for the way you highlighted him. You just let him speak freely and explain his reasoning, as well as his emotional intelligence behind his actions. How did you get him for the film? And why do you think he became such a target? So how that came about was, it started with Alex Vitale, actually. He wrote a book called End of Policing. He's a law enforcement expert. He's been involved for 30 something years with different law enforcement agencies and evaluating the issues and looking at possible solutions and things like that. And so I had been citing his papers throughout my master's program. Mm -hmm. And he was the first person I reached out to about possibly doing an interview. So I reached out to him and he was up for it. And he's in New York. And he was like, hey, you should talk to Jody Armour. He's at USC in Los Angeles, and I'm from Los Angeles. So I reached out to Jody, and we talked. And then it came up in conversation that Jody Armour and George Gascon were on a panel together for something at USC. And I had mentioned that, wow, I would love to talk to him. And so Jody gave me his email, and I contacted him, and he wrote back like immediately and gave me an hour of his time. And was just really gracious and present. And, you know, I was really moved by him. Like he's very heart centered. He really is all about doing the right thing by people and making sure that people are taken care of. 
I didn't know that much about him going in. I mean, I knew he was a progressive prosecutor and had different mm -hmm. ideas, but I, I really learned a ton in that hour that we were together, you wow. know, and talking to like the people in his office who really love him and have a lot of great things to say about him. Why he's a target? I mean, he represents a different way of doing things. He represents the opposite of the status quo, which is locking people up and throwing them away and discarding them. And he talks about it in the film, how the politics of being tough on crime was a big part of what attributed to the massive surge in policing and incarceration rates from the 70s, 80s, up until now, and how like you can chart it out. It's this steep climb. And Ava DuVernay talks about it in 13th, even it's all mapped yeah. out. So he's not the status quo. He's somebody who more and more for me as an observer and participant in work around social justice and work around race relations and just seeing how people interact with each other. Unfortunately, there's a lot of resistance to people agreeing that black and brown people deserve to be safe and taken care of. It's a blunt way of saying it, but I think it's appropriate. And you see it in legislation. You see it in the whole thing about CRT. When people are talking about it, they're not talking about what it really is. It's just this term, but it denies personhood for black people specifically in this country. Anything that represents, oh, quote, those people are going to be able to do whatever they want, we're going to be unsafe, feeds into the institutional racism that's woven through the foundation of this country. And then on the other side, because he is a former police officer and he's not as far to the left as a lot of us on the left would like, there's officers who he hasn't prosecuted. So that's caused some yeah. friction. So he's kind of in this weird place in the middle where he's trying to move towards change, towards this transformation of how we view safety. He was saying that when he was elected, before he even took office was when there was this nationwide rise in crime rates. And yeah. people were blaming him for that. And I've heard people say, oh, this is because of Gascon. And he wasn't even in office yet. Yeah. And there are things that were policies from the previous administration that he was blamed for. And I mean, that happens in politics too, mm -hmm. but it's a tough position, especially when it goes against what we're used to as the status quo. Exactly. And some of that is also like you had been mentioning earlier about even the way the police academy is set up. On average, you said it was like 60 hours of firearms, firearms. training, but mm -hmm. only eight hours of de-escalation. And it just keeps going in that direction. And like you said, it's like we're trying to pull back from that and go in a different direction. So it's an enormous struggle. I remember President Biden gave a speech several months ago where he was talking about police. And literally, he said, we expect them to be therapists and social workers and this and that. And like he listed a bunch of things. And we don't expect them to be that. We expect them to show up and handle our problems. But if we expected them to be therapists and social workers, they would be trained in that. So speaking to what you were saying and what I was sharing about the training, yeah, on the average police departments across the country in their academies, it's 60 hours of firearms training and only eight hours of de-escalation. And as film, that de-escalation is something that comes like towards the end of the academy yeah. and they're doing role playing. And so there's that. And then when they get out in the field, there's a whole thing about you have to prove yourself to the OGs, the old timers, the people that have come before you. And mm -hmm. how do you do that? You get in fights, you be, you know, beat people up, jam people up, frisk people, pull people over, write tickets, make arrests. That's the way that you prove yourself and get ahead. The incentive is all about harm and violence. Yeah, that's true. Hadia said that the training police receive is nothing like when they get out in the real world. She said, like you mentioned, there's no training in how to talk to people until right before the graduation. But that's talking with suspects, not everyday people. If you're just tuning in, today we are talking with Matthew Solomon director of the film Reimagining Safety. Thank you. Hi folks, this is your host, Melina Paris. Angel City Culture Quest is growing. We're barely into our third year now, and there's so much more quest-worthy inspiration to bring you. Art, books, film, coverage of local events, and more. We've gotten a new QR code, 
so you can capture episodes on the go because I know you're busy. We've been creating artistic flyers unique to each episode and new Angel City Culture Quest stickers. And there's more to come. As you know, there are costs to keep this podcast going. So if you're able, join me in this quest with your support. Think of it as a cultural tip jar to share any amount that you're comfortable with. Even a few dollars a month will contribute to my ability to continue bringing you the great work of these artists, activists, and others, and the cultural content that you want to hear about. I would be honored to have your support. To donate, please go to my Patreon link at patreon.com forward slash Angel City Culture Quest. There you can also see all of our past episodes. Thank you. In describing the film, I think that was an excellent connection, which I talked about earlier. You pointed to the protests happen. That included calls to defund or abolish the police. Then this sharp rise in crime gave the politicians that access point to just shut it down. Mm -hmm. It was just like it was an opportunity for them. But like you said, it was the detailed conversation about transforming public safety was never had. And that's what this film does. And then there's this thing about constantly pouring money into the police budget. Yet our infrastructure budget desperately needs those funds for health care, mental health, libraries, education, social structures for our kids, our elderly population, and much more. And as Gascon said, we've defunded our safety nets and shifted that money into policing, prison, and prosecution. But the police and their unions will always say they need more money for more weapons, drones, and now it's the LAPD robot dog, which mm -hmm. is kind of scary. But we don't pour money into those things that we need for our communities to be safe. Another thing in the film is you list the four pillars of defunding. So that's very helpful as well. Now, you said that all of this is like basic sociology for you, and you also point to capitalism as a main cause. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sociology. So that goes back to when I was in college the first time in the early 90s. I was going to USC. I was actually a music student there. And I was really interested in sociology and anthropology and societies and how they get shaped and why they are the way they are. And I'm Jewish. I was always interested in how the different religions, you know, everybody was like, I'm right, you're wrong. And they're like, you're right, I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> it's always us against them. And so, you know, I've always been really fascinated with that. At an early age, it was like, well, who's right was what I was trying to figure out. So that's always been something I've been fascinated with. When I was in college, I took some sociology and anthropology classes because I wanted to understand more about religions and societies and all of that. And so we happened to be learning about systemic racism in one of my sociology courses. And the professor, we were talking about policing and incarceration and how a black person who steals a loaf of bread to feed his family will go to jail. But there was that whole savings and loan scandal that happened around that time mm. where the person that was convicted went to like this resort prison or whatever. Yeah. It was no big deal. And then there was like the crack cocaine and the powder cocaine and all of these discrepancies. And so the, the professor in that sociology class said something to the effect of the laws and rules in society are created by the people in power to keep them in power. They're not going to create laws that will take them out of power. Exactly. So for me, it was yeah. like, wow, that makes sense. Of course, mm -hmm. it's so simple. And you can apply it to every single thing we're dealing with. The people in power are going to keep themselves in power. Unless it's through a different lens, like what we're talking about, where we're more interested in taking care of one another than self-serving our own interests. So that was the sociology part. And you pointed to capitalism. Yeah, this is another touchy subject with a lot of people, yeah. right? Because especially here in the States, we're raised to believe American capitalism, American exceptionalism, profits over people, greed is good, all of that stuff. So in my coursework, not just in the master's program, but when I was finishing my bachelor's work before that, it's been very clearly laid out, especially in the movie 13th, the profit motive for prison. We can apply that profit motive in healthcare with the issues there where there was that guy who was charging 700 a month for insulin 
And so with policing, there's the revenue that comes from writing tickets, from arresting people, from the police budgets themselves, which keep increasing despite people accusing things of being defunded. So the capitalism part is really the profit motive that drives the greed and everything else, which then takes care for humanity out of the equation because it doesn't trickle down. It doesn't go back into communities. It, it yeah. goes to serve like a select few. So that's what I mean when I talk about that. And, you know, a lot of people like to throw around communist and Marxist and all of that. But for me, it's more about are we committed to taking care of each other or are we not? Do I care about my neighbor, whether they're next door to me or 15 miles away, or mm -hmm. do I not? And so for me, it's just the practical thing and just being real, <laughs> you know, just willing to have real conversations and be realistic about, yeah, I'm more invested and interested in people being taken care of. Or I'm more interested in making sure that I have a billion dollars in the bank and, you know, and screw everybody to play else. With. Yeah. yeah, it's an important message, though. And the film also gives us a way to see how to get back to that. A lot of us live in buildings where we don't talk to our neighbors even, and that happens in neighborhoods as yeah. well. But, but we know this as humans, we just don't do it. But in the film, it emphasizes how important that is, and it shows why. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to reimagine how it could and should be. In the film, Jody Armour enumerated in order each of the steps that we as a society have considered when it comes to police reform. And those are, first... We thought, oh, there's just a few bad apples in the police department. Then it was, the police need better training. Then it went to a community policing model is necessary. And then it was going to body cams will help. Then we arrived at the police need implicit or unconscious bias training. And this took us all the way to the murder of George Floyd. And that happened with a police department that had all of these trainings. So one of his points was that, he said, it's abundantly clear reform is not the solution. I'm wondering if you've had experiences as a conflict resolution facilitator with unconscious bias in your dealings with people. And if so, from a sociological perspective, how do you deal with it? And as we're talking about the police, do you believe their unconscious bias could be reversed? It's a big question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot. I'll go in reverse because Dr. Armour, Jody Armour talks about this in the film where there's brain imaging yeah. studies that have been done around unconscious bias. And he says in the film, there's really very little that can be done about that. And then you put police officers in high stress situations. And mm -hmm. so like under stress, we have our fight or flight, but then mm -hmm. automaticities kick in. And so the way police are trained, the automaticities are not about de-escalating, but it's about escalating. It's about control. It's about getting control of the situation or the person protecting themselves and their partners. And that's why things can jump very quickly to somebody being shot multiple times. I've been in various forms of this work for 30 years, starting in my 20s, the deep introspection stuff. Who am I? What do I believe? Why do I believe that way? We all talk about biases. When I'm doing conflict resolution, I like to put it in the frame of filters. We all have different filters. We see the world through different lenses based on how we grew up, where we grew up, what our parents were like, how they treated us, what our teachers were like, what we watched on TV, what we see in movies, all of that shapes our view of the world through our perspective. And so you and I could live on the same street, grow up around the same people, but we would still have different experiences. We would still interpret the world differently because mm -hmm. you're a woman and I'm a man and there's other intersections and yeah. identities within that as well. Like even being left-handed, there's a whole thing about scissors and <laughs> knives. It's a and, whole different thing. You know, yeah. It's a whole different thing. So when I'm doing conflict resolution, I do these exercises with people that helps them recognize, okay, I'm interpreting things, my relationship with this person or this organization or this department in this organization through a filter. I'm making assumptions. I have judgments. But unless I'm willing to be present and ask questions and really get tapped into what is real and what's my interpretation, unless I'm willing to do that, we're just going to be operating off of assumptions. So from that perspective, from that approach, 30 years of me doing this work, I have biases. I still have judgments and interpretations. I can catch them and mm -hmm. I can, for the most part, be like, okay, I'm making an assumption about how I think this person feels about me or about myself. And I can do something with that. 
that takes quite a bit of willingness and it's embodiment, it's introspection, it's like all of that. So to apply that to policing, none of that is in the training. When they talk about bias training or anti-bias training, it's one thing to recognize that I have these biases. It's another to be able to catch it in the moment and interrupt when that comes up, when there's a high stress situation. And that's yeah. most of the situations they're in are high stress, whether they're actually high stress or not, because they're also trained very repetitively. And this has been studied and shown. They watch videos constantly about police getting gunned down at traffic stops. Even the simulator trainings that they have are shoot or don't shoot. So there's this whole hypervigilance that exists also to where our survival brain is like, mm -hmm. is this a threat? Is it not a threat? Is it a threat? Is it not a threat? And everything, and Hadia talks about like, it's high stress, high stress. So the automaticities kick in and it's really just the expectation of the result is worst case scenario because violence is always at the core of what police are trained for. So it's really, how do you mitigate that? It's reducing the contact that the police have with the public. It's being very clear about what their roles should be and shouldn't be because it takes a lot of work to interrupt that. And this is a whole other thing. There's these studies that show like white supremacists in policing. So like even if you had a police force that didn't have white supremacists embedded in the culture, even if you had a police force of people who all of them were like, I really want to do good for my community. I want to know what's best there's still a lot of work that would need to be done there. And that's just the human nature thing. This isn't a dig at police. You know, yeah. this is how we are as a society and what we've been fed for a hundred years of film and however long TV has been around, all these tropes and different stereotypes and things like that of who's dangerous and who's not. Yeah, and that's a whole other thing about yeah. how the money that the whole police umbrella has put into media and film, yes. TV, with cop shows and all that mm -hmm. stuff. That's a whole nother subject. And I don't want to leave it out, but just a quick mention about Elle Jones. Mm -hmm. It was a 200 page report that she mm -hmm. did about what that would look like if we defund or detask the police yeah. and what happens, what they would do, how that would be implemented and so on. So it's almost like the work has been done in the laboratory. Now we just mm -hmm. need to put it out there in the field and make it yeah. real. <laughs> and she talks about how it was out in the field because of COVID. She's in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The report was commissioned by that province. And so she worked with some other co-authors. And so she talks about in the film how because of COVID, they decarcerated like 40% of the population and crime rates didn't go up. So there are examples of that. There are organizations like Cahoots in Eugene, Oregon and Star yeah. in Denver, where they have community responders who show up to certain 911 calls instead of armed police. With those organizations, the police armed response has not been called once. Nobody's been arrested. And both of those organizations have saved their cities millions of dollars. That's huge. Just one quick thought. It's almost like we need what the WPA was for something like this, for people to respond in crisis and social workers to be trained instead of bringing the police in for something yeah. that they're not trained for. It's almost like yeah. that big of a push needs to happen and then society can see the better results from it. Mm -hmm. But that's like pretty lofty and up there. <laughs> and it's got, it's, like, you know, it's got to be a big psychological, emotional toll on police officers also. You know, I'm thinking about as we're talking, like if I'm in a job where I got to deal with all this high stress stuff and I'm not trained for most of it and I'm just doing the best I can, that's got to feel pretty defeating at the end of the day to know that I showed up to this call. I don't know. I did the best I could, but it didn't make a difference. It's got to feel like pretty defeating, I would think. That's sad. Before we go much further, I do want to mention that on your website, Reimagining Safety, which we're going to link to in our show notes, it provides resources for people such as the cast members' websites and social media plus a variety of abolitionist literature that people can check out. So yeah. that's great that you have that on there. Oh, yeah. Now, a little bit about your background. In addition to the entertainment business, you explained how your background is really about taking care of people. This also includes writing a best-selling book, Man School, Relating with Women in the Me Too Era. And you help organizations create inclusive cultures. Before we finish, can you please tell us a little bit more about this part of your work? 
Sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I haven't really talked about it in a while. <laughs> it came about through the work I was doing. I wrote the book. I was writing a weekly column for the Good Men Project, which yeah. is an online publication. And so I was writing about issues regarding relationships and communication and then race and gender and applying all of that. And I think at our core, we want to feel heard, valued, and understood. And we're not taught how to communicate. My generation was suck it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My kids got use your words, but we're not really trained to listen to one another in a way that leaves the other person feeling heard, valued, and understood. And so a big part of what I do is teaching people how to listen and connect. Because when we listen and connect, like I was saying before, the barriers come down and the stuff that we think separates us tends to disappear. And then we can actually work towards something because we're not on the defensive. There was a film, a documentary called Chimpanzee, sometime like late 2000s, I think. Tim Allen narrated it. Mm -hmm. And it followed this group of chimpanzees in this forest. And a baby was born, the mother was killed or died, I forget. And then normally what would happen was that baby would be ostracized and left to fend for themselves and probably die. What happened was the leader of that group this male chimpanzee took in the baby and raised him like it was his child. Wow. Took care of him, fed him, taught, trained him. And the filmmakers had never seen anything like that before. So there was this bond created. Mm -hmm. And then through the film, we see that there's this rival group of chimpanzees who are competing for the territory and the resources. And so through the film, we know that there's this fight coming and they're like bigger, stronger. There's more of them. It doesn't look good for our group that we're following. And so the night before the attack, and we know the attack's coming, that leader goes and sits with all of the males one at a time, sits, like grooms them the ways that they connect. And so when the attack finally comes, they bonded with each one of them, spent one-on-one -on -one time with each one of them. Because they were so united, they pushed them back, pushed them out of the territory and survived. And so we think of leaders as having to be like tough as nails, take no crap, you do what I tell you. But really the leaders who have inspired me, if I think about it, are the ones that I felt cared about me. So when I go into organizations, it's really about instilling that the idea, the culture of care that from the top administrators, the leadership down to the people who are doing like whatever the grunt work is in that organization, that there's a mutual respect and admiration and care for one another. And so that's what I do with my consulting work. That's my approach to just teach people how to show connect. up for each other and connect and care and work together. That's a beautiful story about that film about yeah. the chimpanzees. What is it called? Chimpanzee. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. Well, thank you so much, Matthew Solomon. I really appreciate you coming to spend time today. Can you tell us where we can find you? Yeah. Thank you. This has been a great conversation. Reimaginingsafetymovie.com is the film website. And I'm on Instagram, Reimagining Safety Movie. So following either or both of those would be great. We have a lot of screenings coming up and we keep adding screenings in the U.S. And then I have requests for Canada and Germany and South Africa. That's um, awesome. So for people who want to attend screenings and people who want to host screenings. Actually, the San Jose screening was somebody who heard about the film and was like, how do I bring this to San Jose? And then she actually created a whole thing and brought people in. So to be able to see it and to create an event, you can go to the website and send me a message. And then Matthew Solomon Consulting is my consulting website. That's wonderful. Yeah. And for local audiences, I think there's a film screening, the date to be determined at El Camino College. Yeah, we're working on that. We're doing a screening for sure at the Skid Row Museum and Archive in downtown oh. LA on August 18th. And then we're working on something actually at the Pacific Design Center in West Hollywood. We're working on that, hopefully for July. That would be amazing. Awesome. And then other than that, New York in Harlem on June 4th at the People's Film Festival. And then in Kansas City, Missouri, at the Kansas City Public Library with Decarcerate KC on June 14th. Yay, libraries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.